Hello there, everybody, and welcome to the Talking City podcast brought to you by the Manchester Evening News. My name is Dan Murphy, and joining me today is a full house, no less. Back from his little sojourn in Madrid is, of course, Mr. Simon Bukowski. Si, how's it going? Got a already? He's only there for a day. Very well, you make it sound like I was there for a holiday. <laughs> uh, you got to see some good sights, more than I did in my room watching the game, I'll tell you that, for free. And of course, also with us today is Mr. Joe Bray. Joe, how's it going? Yeah, I didn't get to Madrid, but uh, I, I saw a bit of Manchester, if that if that helps. Mm, there's there's levels <laughs> no, in there, there's no, levels. <laughs> I, I know which one I'd rather be in, given the weather over here over the last week or so. But Sai, as I say, you were in Madrid, you were in the absolutely stunning Bernabeu, and you got to watch a thrilling match in the first leg of the semi final tie between Manchester City and Real Madrid. It ended one goal apiece, two stunning goals from Vinicius Jr. and Kevin De Bruyne. Set up a really juicy second leg, which we'll come on to in due course. But first, what a game it was to just outstanding teams trying to outwit and outmatch each other for 90 minutes. And, you know, it couldn't have ended much better for a thrilling second leg in well, a few days' time now. Yeah, it was uh, one of those where it was a real privilege to be there. It's one hell of a stadium they've got there. Um, and sort of while the new camps seems to be in the middle of being knocked down, sort of the, the Bernabeu may not look great from the outside with all the construction, but it's kind of getting better and better. So it was, um, yeah, really good. And um, I don't know if there was much pickup over here. Wayne Rooney does like a column in the Sunday Times and it, it it's very, very good. Um, and But one of the things he'd said in it, that came out on the Sunday was that City wouldn't just kind of beat Madrid, they'd destroy them. Um, and, you know, it it was kind of fair enough, but but there's, it got picked up by the Spanish press a lot and they really took umbrage with it. And it, it kind of became this, we will show these English people who the real kings are. And, uh, and, and Real did that, you know, uh, I think it, there was a real sense before the game that City could, you know, comfortably win if they played to their best um but the reality is real are so good that they did not let them play to their best um and like you say leave it up up in the air for what should be a, a cracking second leg well maybe it was a shrewd plan from renowned united legend wayne rooney to give real madrid that extra bit of motivation joe but it's not like madrid ever lack it in the champions league they might be not be going great shakes in a league i think the last time I looked, they were like 14 points off Barcelona, I think. Might even be more by this point. They're not going to come anywhere close to lifting the title. But in the Champions League, they can just never be ruled out. There's the aura around them. The only other team that I think comes close to having that sort of kind of romanticism around them is Liverpool, who City have been on the wrong end of one of their results in recent times as well. And, you know, I did think City were at the best for a bit, at least. You know, in that first half an hour, they might not have been... Um, really cutting Madrid up, but they were really suffocating Madrid at times and had a lot of the ball in that first half an hour. But, you know, one stunning strike and the game completely turns on its head. Yeah, it's one of them. City have all the ball, making some really nice moves. A, f- a few shots on target, but nothing that you think is going to test Thibaut Courtois. But you just feel that City need to score to, when they're on top to make the most of it because you can just never rule out Real Madrid. And they, they showed that in very, very emphatic fashion, didn't they? With just one little nice move with Modric, flicks it around the defenders, Camavinga runs away and Vinicius absolutely rockets it into the into the top corner and you can't really complain when, when they do something like that. I, I, I think it might have been Rodri or someone who said that the defending could have been a bit better. Maybe it could have been, but I, I think that's one of the, one of the goals that you just got to hold your hands up and say, do you know what? That's a, a very, very good, a good goal, and it it's a reminder for City. They knew it last year, didn't they? That you can never ever count Madrid out. City were dominant in that first leg at the Etihad last year, and still let Madrid score three goals. And again, we you know we keep coming back to the Bernabeu, the second leg, and City were on top and somehow out of nowhere Madrid come back so um, I, th- I think City did learn a bit from that I think uh, Man- Manu Akanji said that they watched those games in the build up to to see what they did wrong and what they can do better I-, I think there was a bit more maturity about the performance especially after after that Madrid goal they could have crumbled and and maybe conceded another one and suddenly the ties did the chase in it but they, no, I think they deserve credit for how they got back into it mm. Yeah there was certainly a period say, in that you know, 30, 25, 30 minute period where City had all the ball, where Madrid kept kind of showing just what they could do. And it was basically always through Vinicius getting down that right side. And then it was him, of course, who scored that stunning opening goal. And 
it's weird this Madrid team because they have the kind of the veterans in Modric, Cruz, and uh, Benzema, who we all know are world class and continue to be so even well into the mid thirties now. But it almost seems at times like they don't really they're not really the Galacticos of old. But then you see Rodrigo who who dealt City those two blows last year, of course, and was brilliant, I thought. And then Vinicius, who doesn't really get the credit he deserves, but he's probably like one of the best players in the planet on form at the minute, probably only rivaled with City's own Erling Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne, of course. But he was stunning. He was His battle with Kyle Walker was kind of so engrossing. What You know, you say it was a privilege to be there. It must have been quite fun to see him in action live once again because he, he's some player. <laughs> Yeah, Ooh. Ooh. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it was, um, and like Joe said, like you know, could Edison do a bit more for the goal? Well, maybe, but it was like hit so hard and so fast, it like accelerated off his foot and looked like it would have kind of made it to central Madrid if the net hadn't been there. It was just so so strong a hit. Um, I didn't think like Vinicius v Walker was like a huge battle. Over the course of the night, I didn't really see it as like a big, a, a big kind of um, where the game was was won or lost. Um, maybe that's just me, but I, I kind of I feel like Walker v Vinicius was something that was like written backwards. Like once you see Walker hugging him after mm. the game, you're like, what a great show of sportsmanship. And then you kind of like, oh yeah, they had a big battle, didn't they? And and I I didn't see it really. I think there was that one bit towards the end of the match where Vinicius had it in his own half and Walker kind of chased him. It was like a minute period yeah. where they like was proper closing him down doggedly. And I think you're right, that was about it. But kind of away from Walker, the Vinicius kind of his, his influence on the match, he just yeah. seems like he's only young and he's. I feel like his decision-making all the time was just perfect. The passes he was making and he's going to be the big threat at the end. Yeah, and... Um... But I mean, you know, don't rule out Valverde or someone mm. like that. It's kind of like, you know, the Madrid team is like a, a masterclass in how to sort of rebuild with with young and old. And mm. you've got like Modric and Cruz and, um, you know, Vinicius was spot on. But the whole team mm. and b- both teams really, what like kind of stood out from, from my seat was just how incredibly cool they were under pressure. One team would be attacking and sling a ball into the box and there wasn't like, it wasn't a hacked clearance. Each time it was a player who knew exactly what was going on around him and could sort of just pass the ball to a teammate and intercept under immense pressure. And mm. and that, it, it really did feel like, you know, these are two of the best teams you will ever see performing yeah. at, at near their best. Yeah, it, it wasn't like, Joe, that either team didn't kind of deliver or was... Good. In a way, it was kind of strange because it was it almost like there was no real standouts, I think, apart from Vinicius. It was more like there were two amazing teams and they kind of cancelled each other out a little bit. Like size ratings, I think most of City's players got sevens out of ten. I think Rodri got an eight and then there was a couple of sixes. There was no massive ten out of ten and there was no absolute shock on either side. It was like both teams really cancelled each other um, cancel each other out, and it was. I thought it was quite interesting how Madrid set up, even as like the home team at times, especially in that opening thirty minutes. It was almost as if Madrid had a back five with Valverde going at going into that centre back. It was a really low block, and as Ancelotti said um, afterwards, like they might have had the ball, but we were quite comfortable in it. They didn't. They only had shots from I think De Bruyne went through once, and that might have been in the second half on the on, down the uh, from a wide position. Mostly City shots were from distance, and I think Grealish even said afterwards that that's we knew that's how we'd score from distance and um, is it kind of interesting they settled like that even in the first you know even at home and then went and advanced on City uh, is that how we're going to see it in the second leg you know we'll talk more about on that a bit later but it seems like Madrid are kind of comfortable with City having the ball and not to say it's a hit and hope but kind of trying to get them on the break a bit more with that pace they've got I think Thibaut Courtois was really really mm. interesting on that after the game he said that to stop the runs of Haaland they defended a lot deeper than they would, sacrificed a lot of the possession. So Haaland did have quite a quiet game. He had a couple of shots on target, but straight at the goalkeeper. A lot of people saying, oh, well, he, he didn't really do much. I think the fact that he was occupying those defenders so much gave City that space in in that sort of Kevin De Bruyne area, if you like. Rodri had a couple of efforts where he just thought, you know what, let's have a shot. And then obviously City's goal come, comes from that area. And Courtois was saying that because they're used to possession as well in, in La Liga, they're probably quite similar to City in that they will have the majority of the ball in their games. They were, they rushed it a little bit. I think he he his message was that they, they weren't using the possession mm. as wisely as, as they could have done. But then you see that, 
you know the, the goal where it does come together they do catch City on the break and, and they do get that space to run and, and they score a very good goal from it so it mm. seems like City are keen to get Haaland far more involved in the second leg and Madrid will try and keep him quiet but also try and make more of their, their possession at the same time but yeah I, I echo what, what Sai said it, it was a, a game where nobody had a bad game the, the quality mm. was just so so high the technical and tactical sort of chess match I think they referred to it on BT Sport it, it was it was just a lot of footballers and coaches at the very very top of the game wasn't it Oh yeah, I think there was like one. There was one bit side in the first half that I kind of noticed. It was like Diaz was on the ball and around the center circle, and literally no one went near him or pressed him at all. He was literally like, it was like almost stood still on the ball for about ten seconds, which feels like an eternity when you watch your football. And then with kind of no option, he kind of ran straight forward and then lost it. And Madrid, I think that might have been that first chance I mentioned when Madrid counted really quick, and it was almost like Madrid were just kind of waiting to spring the trap on City at times. It's like kind of what they need to be wary of because obviously Rodrigo and Vinicius and Benzema, they've got so much quality going forward and it's, I wouldn't say City defended poorly but, or Madrid even attacked poorly. It was weird because it was so good but I feel like Madrid, if they had a, were a bit more clinical, could have done dealt City a bit more damage at times. Well, that was it. Those first 15 to 20 minutes you're watching and you think City are dominating here. Mm. City, are, City are dominating Real Madrid at La Bernabeu, right. And then the longer it goes on, you think, actually, you watch Real, they're not bothered. No. They don't exactly. they, they don't want the ball. They don't need the ball. Like, City have got 70% position and Real have got them exactly where they want them. It was um, it, it was kind of just like this dawning real, realisation that actually, you know, the, the home team were in control after all. Um, and then they went and scored and... And then in the second half, like, again, it, it was just kind of this momentum they sort of carried in the second half. It was it was kind of like, you know, what it must have been like in the Coliseum when the sort of plucky Christians or gladiators or whoever have kind of notched up a few, a few early wins and then everyone's just like waiting for the Lions to come out. <laughs> and it, it, it felt like City were going to get eaten alive and 2-0 and would have been huge to come back from but sort of just as Real seemed poised to pull the trigger um, Kevin De Bruyne did instead and you know as as good as City have been and as much as this has kind of been you know almost dangerously portrayed as like a coronation to a treble um, it was a sign of how how good Real are and will be in the second mm. leg um, but for that reason to come away with a 1-1 from Madrid is a is a phenomenal result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting how kind of Madrid scored its city's best moments of the game and their city scored in Madrid's best moments of the game, a, a weird mirroring. But as you kind of touched on earlier, Joe, we've been talking quite a lot recently about, especially after that Bayern Munich second leg, how City have this newfound resilience, a bit more maturity, as you mentioned there. And when thing you know, in the previous Champions League exits, it's been hallmarked by just sudden unpreventable kind of collapses, unstoppable collapses. You know, you've got Liverpool, Monaco, Madrid last year, um, Tottenham. I, when, when soon as one kind of goal goes against them and those winds of change start blowing against City, it's almost as if they've just been absolutely powerless, even mentally or physically, to, to stop it. But here, it felt for a moment that it was going to happen again. Vinicius scored, City like, how has that happened? It's come out of nowhere. And then Madrid, you know, roared on by that amazing crowd crowd suddenly City are under the cosh a little bit the pressure's on it's continued into the second half but they didn't will at this time they they, you know, they had the wobble they had a shaky moment but they, they managed to get to the half time they regained their composure and and they held they held them out and not many other teams go there in that sort of sort of environment and and do that after after facing such kind of pressure so Again, it just shows how much they're growing and how, and how good that defence has become without Nathan Ake, we should say as well. I think it, it's the defence, but it's also just the whole team. That, and, and I keep coming back to it, it's, the maturity was so more advanced than it was last year. You know, last year felt like a, a basketball game in will score, you'll score, and end to end. This one was a, a bit more of a chess match, as we say. And I, I, I just think City are a bit wiser a bit more street wise now they've, they've learned from those mistakes there was there was no Guardiola roulette was there there was no surprise in the team everyone in, in that team sheet had a role you knew where they were going to be 
nobody was particularly concerned with anyone playing. Maybe Akanji was the only one that you'd have any question mark over, but he's been very good and was the only real option at left back, having having played there in recent games when Ake hasn't been fit. It it just felt like City were ready to go to the Bernabeu and and not do anything silly, which they did last year. They've done in other big games, like you say. When when they get to to one one towards the end, there's a couple of chances where they have breaks, and I think De Bruyne goes forward a couple of times. Haaland has the ball. They're not supported by anyone, but that's probably quite a clever thing that your likes of Gundogan and Bernardo stay back. You've got you've not got any fullbacks pushing on. They th- they think right, well let's let's have a go at scoring, but we're not going to push loads of men forward and, and risk a counter attack. Because if, if they'd conceded a late goal, Madrid take a 2-1 lead to the Etihad. Madrid are strong favourites for, for the tie. Now you think City are not strong favourites, but they are probably favourites given that they're at, at the Etihad and and they've got a 1-1 scoreline. So I, I just think it was a, a a more clever, more mature performance. And, you know, the, we always hear them say it's only half time in the tie. I mean, it's it's true in this respect. If if they go in at half time, as we say, at one one, it's it's a far better result than than mm. than they could have hoped for. And I think it was absolutely the right decision not to not to push on after that Kevin De Bruyne goal, which feels really sort of counterproductive to say. But the fact that they did that, they kept their heads, they they they're looking at the the longer picture, shows maybe a bit of progression in in that city mindset that we might not have seen before. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And Sai, you were there in, in that atmosphere when that goal goes in. Did you get the sense of like, oh, here we go again. City are going to kind of just throw it away and completely um, collapse under the pressure. And, you know, in contrast, when they didn't do that, was it even more impressive? And like, you know, that you were, were there a year ago, like what the difference to then and now, like it's quite stark, isn't it? And how much they've grown. Yeah, I, I think they had um, kind of a wobble, like Real immediately attacked after the goal and and got sort of close to the box and you thought oh what's going on here but then it was that you know second half pressure where it wasn't like City were wilting it was just like they were being beaten back constantly um, and you, you just wondered how on earth do they survive this and all kind of bets pointing towards them not surviving it um, and then they scored to kind of release that that pressure valve but even then Real still came at them for the for the final 20 minutes yeah I think um you know as as Joe said it's a whole team thing and um you know Rodri had done the pre-match press conference and said you know this is an opportunity for for revenge um and then Pep was asked about that immediately afterwards and said absolutely not you know, it would be a huge mistake for the players to and and what he didn't want was them to go out charging like kind of losing their heads, thinking they have to avenge last season or they have to, um, you know, just blow Real away. Um, and you got more of a chess match and, and there wasn't much goal mouth action because like last season, of course, you know, Real were whipped up by every brilliant save that Courtois made to to stop the, the tie going beyond even before the they scored. Whereas here, there really wasn't kind of the the big goal mouth action. It was just kind of two teams, as, as you said, like sort of cancelling each other out. But but that will please Guardiola that they showed that restraint um, and that yeah. I mean, Real will fancy the second leg. City fancy the second second leg. City really good at home. This this year, especially good in the Champions League. And, you know, you could easily see it coming. You, you could see Wayne Rooney's prediction coming to pass where City win. City are a bit more, you know, aggressive in the second leg, win 3-0 like they would beat Bayern 3-0. You could also see Real coming away with a 1-0, 2-0 win. But City have it in their locker to to progress to the final and, you know, if if you'd offered Guardiola that before the first leg kicked off, he'd have he'd have bit your hand off for it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's like um, it's like the last year's ties were like bombastic action films, like Fast and Furious, just all just all pomp and circumstance. Whereas this year, it's like your cerebral, intriguing kind of political thriller, and maybe and maybe the next leg it'll explode into action. But we'll be back in just a moment, dear listeners, to talk about that second leg and dissect the first leg a little bit more. So stay tuned. 
everybody, and welcome back to the Talking City podcast. Now, Joey, it would be a miss of us if we didn't delve into Kevin De Bruyne's great goal, wouldn't it? Because, you know, just as City's backs were against the wall and he was looking like all hope may have been lost, the ball fell to him some 30 yards from goal and he absolutely funded it into the net. It was an absolutely fantastic finish and exactly what City needed when they needed it most. And De Bruyne, once again, just... He delivers. He delivers when City need him. I, I heard someone. I think it was on the Football Clichés podcast. Not to not to uh, promote our rivals, of course. But um, I think someone on there said the other day that De Bruyne was kind of quite a bit Gerard in the way he. And I hope that's not a negative connotation, but um, in the way he, uh, at the peak of his Liverpool uh, prime, he'd t- take games into his own hands, and the the goal was quite similar to his famous one against Olympiacos, where it comes to him and he just you know effort it's going into the bomb corner see you later and it was it was fantastic there's an angle of it I think City have tweeted it recently where it's from behind the goal and the ball just doesn't move he hits it and the ball just stays still as it flies past Courtois and it's quite a good um, battle between Courtois and De Bruyne obviously they know each other from way back in in Belgium duty but you know, they, they were equal to each other, but there was no chance, no chance that one was getting saved. And he just, he's, he's a big game player, isn't he? He's, you know, there's no one else you would want in a game like that. And he'll start the second leg. If City get through to the final, he'll start that game. I think Guardiola said before the Leeds game, if De Bruyne is fit, he plays because this is the time of the season where every game's a big one and you need your big players. And De Bruyne is, you know, we we talk about Haaland, don't we? And all these players who've been doing so well this season. De Bruyne remains City's best player and the best player on the big nights and in the big stadiums. And he, he showed that at, at Real Madrid. He's, he, it felt like he's born for that sort of arena in that game. And I, th- I think the Gerard comparison is is fair because, you know, when City needed it, as we've said, City were under pressure in that second half. 2-0, two, two we've touched on, would have been a very bad scoreline for City. It would have changed the tie completely, but, you know, he, he pops up and absolutely rifles it in, in the back of the net and suddenly City have the control that they wanted from the tie back. And yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we've we just come on, on the podcast hearing that Erling Haaland's won the first of probably many uh, end of season awards. I, I I will always say that Kevin De Bruyne is, is City's best player and has been as good, if not better than Haaland this season. Mm. No, I mean, yeah, he just, you know, there was that kind of shaky patch, wasn't there, at the start of the year where most mm-hmm. players were um, below par, but he's kind of come back with a vengeance. And so, of course, a great goal, another kind of pivotal, almost captain-like performance from him. But, you know, there was a, a bit of controversy surrounding the goal as well, which you're now going to have to talk about because you were there. I want to know <laughs> what the reaction was like in the press box to that because um, for those, I imagine everyone does know, but Carlo Ancelotti, um, Bernardo Silva saw um, kind of challenge for the ball right in front of the Madrid manager. He saw it to his opinion, go out. The ball continued in play. City lost it to Madrid. Um, Camavinga then gave it away. So a completely different passage of play before it then got nudged to De Bruyne to smash home. So it wouldn't have been an issue for VAR anyway because it was a, a new phase of play. But Ancelotti was not happy. I don't think I've seen him lose his cool ever. So it was quite weird to see him shouting and get booked. But what kind of what was the feeling in the uh, um, in the Bernabeu with that and what, what were your view on it at all? Uh, I will just say first, as as close as this podcast comes to conflict, there is no way De Bruyne has had a better season, Joe. Than <laughs> really? Absolutely no way. Yeah, better, um, season, no, better, better player. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll take this one somewhere where we need ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I didn't think De Bruyne was particularly good on the night, but he scored the goal, so happy days. Um, yeah, there weren't any, to bore you with media stuff, there weren't any um, TVs with replays in our press box. So oh, okay. um, it was very much a have to remember everything that's going on uh, while contributing to live blogs and writing reports, etc. So not that we don't watch every second of the action, but sometimes things do pass you by. Um, and yeah, it was just confusion really after... Um, after the goal, because it, it looked to all intents and purposes like a goal. And then Real are going mad and you're sort of thinking, did Rodri kind of like, was he overly aggressive in winning the ball back? Was something going on? And then you kind of remembered the the throwing, the throwing that was it a throwing or was it not? Um, and 
uh, th- that seemed like the most likely option, but at the same time, it was kind of like way, way back in our minds because so much had gone on from that moment. Like I, I was pretty sure that, yeah, the, there had been another passage of play before Rodri won the ball back, but then it was all kind of legitimized by Ancelotti coming out in his press conference afterwards and saying, I've seen the image from Bay in sport. Um, Cause he said, you know, we're not talking fact opinions. This is fact. The ball was out. And one of the journalists actually said like, we, we've not had anything from VAR or anything that says it was out. And he said, no, no, Bay in sport, Bay in sport. Uh, the ball was out. Um, so you, you just kind of, yeah, I, I I kind of take it as like, you know, like when your team is kind of denied a corner and then the other team go up the other end and score, like it might be annoying, but you've still done a load of things wrong for the other team to go up the other end and score. Um, there was so much that that happened since. And, you know, we we don't know and we cannot know if the ball was out. So giving it kind of too much influence um, is is, yeah, a bit. It, it it wasn't really a big thing. It was made into a bigger thing than it should have been by, um, like say Ancelotti being dead weird. But then he also kind of, um, I don't know, came across a bit. <laughs> it was just like, oh, I don't know why the referee's giving the managers a yellow card. He should be giving them to the players. The player, the ones who play, and you kind of like, yeah, it's a bit funny, but it's also a bit like, um like five, 10 years ago when <laughs> managers weren't given yellow cards. Like we've known about this for quite some time and managers having the opportunity to, opportunity to be booked and or sent off. So it's not like some novel thing in football. Um, and also Ancelotti could probably be thankful that the ref did not give out more yellow cards to his players who were very, very dirty throughout and well, managed to avoid getting booked. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was one <laughs> culprit, particularly who I'm sure anyone had a bet, like I know several of my friends did, um, on a certain uh, Spanish right back to get a yellow card. May well have been absolutely furious because Danny Carvajal should have been booked about eight times in that first half, uh, especially for his fouls on Jack Grealish, the most egregious, egregious of which, Joe, was when he just completely needlessly shoved him when the ball was going out of play into the uh, advertising and boardings behind the uh, kind of the byline and then had the temerity when Grealish said get off me you madman to just throw himself on the floor as if he'd been whacked by um, a Mike Tyson right hook and it was highly amusing to have sort of this uh, you know the level of S housing that we always like in football but you know City did really well to not kind of rise to it and Grealish especially to you know even after the match he was quite good natured about it and said he enjoyed the battle um, and you know I think he was potentially holding his tongue a little bit there because I don't know if I would have liked being shoved into a big metal um, light bulb encrusted uh, board but each to their own I suppose. Well, it, it wasn't even a free kick, that was it? The, the referee just gave the goal kick, which <laughs> <laughs> absolutely baffling. But I mean, that incident alone could have got Carvajal two yellow cards because, but you know, by by anyone's standards, that that shove is is needless and is is a yellow card, and the the play acting deserved a yellow card of its own. But there was, I think, four or five just trips on on Grealish that, by a totting up process, should have been a yellow card as well. So, yeah, I think. He was very, very lucky, not only just to be on the pitch at half time, but to not have a yellow card at all. And then I don't think he got booked in the end, did he? So it was, uh, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. And, and the Rudiger challenge on Gundogan, which again went unpu- unpunished, not even a free kick. Comparisons being made to the, the Kevin De Bruyne challenge in the Champions League final when he played for Chelsea. I mean, that could have done Gundogan some serious injury. Kroos you know, cleans out Gundogan and finally gets gets a booking. But um, I, I think I wrote that the, the treatment on Gundogan as well and Grealish shows where Madrid thought that the danger was going to come from and they were trying to stop any any uh, service to Haaland. They'd, they'd marked Haaland out of the game relatively well, but they, they were still keen not to not to get any service to that front line. And uh, they, they sort of did a very physical job on City and got a bit of help from the referee, I think you've got to say, because uh, I think he forgot he had his cards until the 45th minute. 
Mm-hmm, absolutely. I mean, City, I mean, sorry, City are no are no strangers to the cynical foul and getting away with it. You know, Fernandinho was famed for his uh, mastery in that regard. But um, you know, in the home leg, if Madrid can try and do those tactics again with a you know obviously a, a home crowd on the referee's back, will that kind of hopefully play in City's favour a bit more? Or well, I guess it all depends on which referee they get. I'm not I'm not quite sure who it's going to be, but you know, you get the sense that it might not quite work quite as well for Madrid if they try it in Manchester yeah it will depend on the referee and you can place no consistency among the referees in the Champions League like it's not that they're bad it's just that they're like they have different standards from their own nations you imagine yeah but I mean they they make Premier League referees look kind of semi-consistent which is (laughs) which is some going um yeah, I mean, it, it it was kind of just another sign of um, how good Real Madrid are that they're willing to they're, they're willing to sort of go at City in a calculated way to disrupt them, um, and it, it was it, it felt you know like what City played Arsenal and it was just men against boys and City's plan was far better than Arsenal's and City's players were far better than Arsenal's and and it wasn't a contest. This felt like two just kind of huge beasts going up against each other and and trying to do anything they could. Um, And, you know, City were hardly angels. I think Rodri was probably lucky to, I can't remember if he got booked or not, but he um, certainly made enough fouls to get booked. Um, But just anything to get an edge and anything to throw the other side off their game. And uh, City will have to be be wary of it in the second leg. But um, but it, it, it's a, lo- a lottery to know whether it'll be clamped down on more or more let go in the second leg because we just don't know. The only thing we can expect from Champions League referees is inconsistency. And at least they're consistent on that. Eh? But, um, Joe, we kind of touched on it earlier. Haaland was quite, it was kind of a muted display from him. You know, it was well marshaled. It wasn't exactly his fault or anything. I thought Rudiger and uh, Alaba did really well on him. Alaba, especially, he made one amazing tackle at one point, if not a couple, and like, he, he was really good. Um, both centre backs were good. Um, Eden Militao will probably come back in for the second leg after he was suspended for the first. So you'd expect Rudiger to make way anyway. But, you know, Madrid have shown that they can kind of keep him quiet. It wasn't all them. You know, City didn't find him enough as well. But, you know, we I think we had one clear Haaland chance early on when he went through a bit on the left and we thought, oh, here we go. He's had his first sight of goal in. Now he's the next one that comes, he'll, he'll be firing him in. But the, the next one didn't really come clear cut. And again, I don't think it was that Haaland himself was poor or anything. It's just that he wasn't found and he was marshaled really well. And is that a kind of concern going into the second leg where you would expect Madrid to even be more defensive going away, uh, away from home? I think I wrote in our blog after he'd had a couple of shots on target that Against Leeds, he looked like he was never going to score, even though he was getting in the positions. Against Madrid, he looked like he was just warming up and and he was going to get another chance. And then he didn't get another chance. He was, you know, relatively quiet. But I, th- I think I looked at his his record this season. He's not failed to score against a team the second time round. Or I think Liverpool is the only one the second time round, and then he scored the third time round. So if he's t- faced a team more than once. He scored against them this season, so I'd, I'd, I'd say that would worry Madrid. They will. I mean, they've they've clearly found a tactic that they can keep him quiet. But when when they were speaking after the game, they sort of admitted that it was a little bit at at, at the expense of, of their attacking and and their usual system. And they've got to go for the win as much as City do in the second leg. So maybe that will force them to come out a little bit more. Maybe that will give Haaland a bit more space. I would I would expect him to be a bit more involved in the second leg. And he's such a clever player, isn't he? He he may have been quiet, but he will have learned a lot about that Madrid defence, even if Militao comes back. So I would expect him to be yeah a bit more involved in, in the second leg. Mm-hmm. And so it was... Guardiola said quite a few times that his players are tired. I think it was before this Madrid match or maybe the Leeds one. The Leeds one, I think, actually. When he said, oh, I've come in training today and uh, the players are just absolutely tired. Um, I'll have to see on Saturday before the in the last training session who plays or not. And then it was seven changes for the Leeds match, was it? And I, I've always thinking, I'd, I've not really seen many signs of 
tiredness yet. I think he's rotated the squad well and everyone seems quite fresh. But I did think going towards the end of um, the match on Tuesday, I did get to see the first signs of tiredness. I think Gundogan in particular was a bit sloppy on the ball at times, giving it away in midfield. Um, Bernardo, and they were far from the only culprits of it, of it especially when you know, City don't use any subs again. Like... Is it was it just because it was a, you know I think the commentary mentioned like because of the building at the Bernabeu at the minute it's like even more hot than usual um, especially at pitch at pitch level it was a really nice day so the heat was oppressive the atmosphere was raw because of course it's against an incredible team um but you know they said after the Bayern Munich match that they they were all goosed and they, they, I thought they kind of started looking tired in action there is is it a concern that maybe the the tightness might be catching up to them now at the crucial stage. They've managed to kind of stave it off for quite longer than usual. But you know, with the final of the FA Cup to come, this this match of course on Wednesday and some crucial games are in the Premier League. Is is there is there a worry that the tightness might be coming now? Yeah, absolutely. Um they they're just there isn't any respite and the games aren't getting any smaller. Um I, I I'm not sure what he does for for Everton this weekend. Um, I can't remember whether whether it was pre or post match, but he kind of said it, it's good good for the for them in the Premier League that they've had from Tuesday to Sunday um, before they play Everton. But then it's bad for them for the Champions League that they play Sunday and then Wednesday. They'd have rather played Saturday Wednesday. Um, for, for their Champions League hopes, so um, so so there's no there's no wins, there's no easy way around anything, and yeah, like the Bayern game, especially the second leg, took far more out of them than I think they were hoping for, and that meant that some players went to him or said before Sheffield United, look, I, I'm, I'm just knackered, and and some people did the same against Leeds, and um, there will be undoubtedly people doing that before Everton. And, you know, I'd, I'd be surprised if we saw seven changes, but uh, but he's got to make sure that the players that he are his absolute essentials for, for Real are as, are as fresh as, as possible. So it's it, it's hard, but chasing a treble is, is hard. Um, you know, if they beat Everton, then they'll be four points clear. I don't know when Arsenal play this weekend, but, you know, that kind of... They, Hope, hopeful for for an Arsenal slip, I guess, because um, I think if Arsenal win all the games, they need five points from three games after Everton, pretty much if they win. Um, but that would obviously be reduced if Arsenal don't win. So it's um, it, it yeah, it it's tough. It's really tough. Um, such is life when you're at this stage of the season and when you're playing against this calibre of opponent, you know, mm-hmm. playing Sheffield United in the FA Cup semi kind of allowed a bit of a reset because, um, you know, they weren't playing, say, United and uh, Leeds at home last weekend gave him the strength to to rest some players, although that game wasn't as, as comfortable as it was. It, Guardiola has talked so much recently about how difficult it will be at Goodison Park. I'd be surprised if he if he rotates a lot, but he, he's going to have to rotate a bit because mm-hmm. there are some, some really tired legs. And that's before you get into whether, you know, he might want to start a Maris or a Foden against Real in the second leg and thus give him a start at Everton. Well, we'll certainly talk about Everton in just a moment, but first off, I think we'll be able to get a podcast in uh, next week before the second leg, but Joe, if we do, I don't think you'll be on shift. So a brief thought. So how do you think this, this second leg's going to go? I think City might edge it, but I don't think it will be easy. I, th- I think, I mean, it, Real, Real Madrid showed that they can be 2-0 down with a minute to spare and still get something out of the tie. So uh, I think City will have to be on it. They'll have to have all their best players ready and as fit as possible. But uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be confident in giving you a scoreline, but I think City will probably, this time I think they've got enough about them. Well, we can't wait to see and find out. And you can't wait to see and find out, dear listeners, what we've got to talk about in part three. You'll have to just wait and see. So don't go anywhere. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to 
the Talking City podcast. And we'll now turn our attentions to the Premier League. We didn't get to hop on um, earlier um, last week to talk about the Leeds match. So briefly, Zai, as you just touched on then, a 2-1 win over Big Sam's lead at, at Leeds, um, racing to a 2-0 lead. And it looked for all the world that it was going to be a whitewash, a comfortable one. But then a mad um, final 10 minutes where you see Gundogan squander the chance for his hat-trick from the penalty spot. And then Leeds go up the other end um, after, and concede, of course, to a former Real Madrid player, no less in Rod Rigo. Um, so he managed to get through the little wobble there and win 2-1. An important win. Um, how, how did you kind of find that match uh, briefly? <laughs> Yeah, it was a strange match because it should have been like 8 0, but Harlan missed a string of cities. Harlan was, Harlan was kind of as culpable against Leeds as he wasn't really against Real. Um, because, yeah, against Leeds, he had so many chances that he should have scored and um, didn't, which is very unusual for him. But, you know, everyone's allowed an off day, um, especially when their teammates score two goals to uh, to mean that they, they can. Yeah, I mean, Guardiola will be. Pretty happy with everything, but the final 10, 10 minutes or twenty minutes, or you know, they they just kind of they scored two so early that it kind of killed the game off, and the whole game was sleepwalking. And then, you know, there was the the drama around the penalty at the end that Haaland gave to Gundogan, and Gundogan then missed, and then Guardiola was so fuming with that he was screaming at Haaland, and then he um, substituted Gundogan without even looking at him. So. Um, yeah, that is uh, a, a bunch of winners who aren't happy when uh, when their chance of winning is jeopardised. I suppose it was it, it it was too close for comfort in the end. But if you bank on Harlan taking at least one of those chances on any other given day, then it was about as as comfortable a, an afternoon as as they would have wanted. Yeah, absolutely. The only kind of downside to the weekend was that Arsenal only went up to Newcastle and ended up getting a really impressive win um, over third place Magpies. And, you know, so it means that it's still just a point behind. City still have that game in hand, of course. But, you know, it does seem so that the, the title race is going to kind of ride on till the, till the death with, um, with how it's going. Um, we'll talk about the weekend's fixtures in just a moment. But an impressive win for Arsenal and against City, it was not as comfortable as they wanted, but given the circumstances that we discussed, you know, with Big Sam and how the new manager bounce, especially when it's Big Sam doing the bouncing, can change things. At the end of the day, you, you can't mourn about three points, especially with seven changes made. Yeah, they made all the changes, didn't they? And it, it helps when Leeds allowed exactly the same goal twice in 10 minutes with Mares unchallenged, allowed to pick out Gundogan, no one near him at the edge of the area, just found one bottom corner and then the other bottom corner, it was far too easy, even though there were two very, very good finishes. Um, but no, I, th- I think it was, given the circumstances, given that a lot of players were rested, a few players came in that haven't played in a while, like Rico Lewis, Eric Laporte, who both got praise from the manager. I think it was... It's it's one of those sort of stages now where three points is three points, and as long as you win, it it doesn't really matter how you play. Um, and then the Arsenal form does does tie into that because if Arsenal keep winning, then City know they just have to keep winning, and and there's no room for any error aside from that. And it it could help City, even though we're talking about the the fixtures coming up, the the tiredness that is clearly creeping into the squad with every passing game. If Arsenal slip up, that maybe gets into the head of City and tells them that they have a bit bit of room for error. They don't really. I know they have one extra game to play, which does give them that sort of buffer zone. But if Arsenal keep winning, City have to do the same. And we've seen from previous title races that City are better when they have a team pushing them. So it probably helps override the tiredness because they know that they have to win every game regardless of who's playing and where they're playing and what what happens elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as you say, it's it's set up to be an interesting uh, Sunday um, for the Premier League uh, title race. City play first when they go to Everton and Arsenal side actually play Brighton at home. Now, it's intriguing that those two teams, of course, played each other earlier last week and out of nowhere, free scoring Everton are among us. They absolutely um, battered Brighton um, and it's almost out of nowhere. Sean Dyche has got his team playing. Dwight McNeil was... Quite, quite, really, really good. Adelaide Corey scored twice, and it, it's 
it's looking like um, it could be quite a challenging one. Good, as Guardiola says himself, it, um, Goodison Park is by no means an easy place to go, um, especially if that crowd get behind them. And they are fighting for their lives down there, Everton. It was a good win for them. But you'd imagine with that co- confidence you get out of such an unexpected and massive victory, they, they'll come into this with a bit of renewed hope that you probably wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, it's a trade-off, isn't it? Because they will be more confident, but they'll be less desperate. Mm-hmm. Um you know, having when you're at the bottom, you desperately need a win, desperately need a win. They they got that at Brighton. So whether that um means there there is that sort of slightly less drive unconsciously. Um will kind of depend on the, the Saturday results as well. But there are so many sort of awful teams at the bottom of the table that you won't be you won't be surprised if Everton stay up. Um, regardless of if they beat beat City or not. Yeah, it's quite an interesting day with City's game coming kind of directly before Arsenal's. It's, it's got, when you're at this stage of the season, it's one of those, you know, days that could really swing it. Um, if, you know, City drop points and then Arsenal win, it will feel huge for, for Arsenal. And if City win and then Arsenal don't, it's, uh, yes, similar. So um, it's, very exciting as the as most of this season has has been really certainly mm-hmm. the the second part of it but um you know city will be expecting a tough match at, at goodison and you know everton certainly have to perform for for their home fans um who haven't had much much joy but i i just wonder whether them winning so well at brighton the other um week might kind of help city in a mm-hmm. weird way well, we've, we've touched on it, Joe, with the changes with Leeds. And how, what sort of changes do we expect at Goodison? You'd, you'd kind of predict one of Foden and Mares or maybe both to come in. And then Alvarez, you'd maybe expect to start. But as we saw against Leeds, there's scope for Lewis to come in, there's scope for the port. Like, how, how, how deep, you know, there's even scope for Ortega, of course, after the, the West Ham match. So, how, how deep do you think he'll go, you know, with just three days before Madrid comes to town? I think the, the majority of the players that stayed on the bench will play a large part. You've got players like Laporte, Rico Lewis, as you say, um, both the wingers I can see see playing um, Foden's squad at, at Goodison Park last year and is doing nothing wrong to, to be on the bench apart from that there are better players or better systems ahead of him that he, he doesn't quite fit into. So um, I think just for the, the tiredness that is clearly in the squad, I think he will use use those players and also if he rests players it might not be a full 90 minutes rest it might be 60 minutes rest or 30 minutes rest and and ro- rotate that way but i mean the 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 primary objective will be three points obviously and um he's mentioned guardiola for three or four weeks now that goodison park is coming up not everton goodison park and city were you know narrowly won there last year there was obviously that Rodri penalty decision that Liverpool still aren't over that probably was a handball um, but wasn't given and the year before City needed two late goals to to win earlier in the season City dominated and then conceded to one uh, absolutely fantastic strike from Damari Gray and you know they've dropped points again so I think he knows this is going to be probably one of the toughest games of the running so as much as he'll probably have to rotate for the fitness he's got to go he can't rotate fully he can't for example bring in Calvin Phillips I don't think and just give him a run out because he needs his senior players there to to actually get the job done well, that's exactly who I was going to ask a site about because, you know, City's running is quite, it's quite tough there last four games three of them are away starting with Goodison Park but then you know, you say it's one of the toughest uh, in terms of like league position. It's the easiest. They've got Chelsea mm-hmm. at home, which is their, their only remaining home match, and then two away games in a week at Brighton and Brentford. Um, where Bright- Brentford, of course, being the team that um, beat City just before the World Cup break. So it's a it's a really incredibly tough kind of run of fixtures side. I know, and another midweek one thrown in there as well. So he, he's he's going to have to, you know, something's going to give. And does Callum Phillips finally make his first Premier League start for City? <laughs> No. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I mean, as you might have guessed from my bumbling earlier, I've no idea what he does for, <laughs> for Goodison, really, because he, he 
has to make changes, but it will depend on who who is tired. But you know, if you're looking at Phillips, he came on uh, the back end of Leicester game. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. last month and was very bad and then didn't start the FA Cup semi-final even though Rodri didn't play and didn't start last weekend at Leeds even though Rodri didn't play and Leeds at home and Sheffield United are easier fixtures than Everton away um, you know it, it's it's a similar thing Guardiola was asked in last week's press conference and you know Joel agree how painful those questions were to sit through <laughs> really with Guardiola's responses um, where he didn't exactly say that Phillips wouldn't play very much, but it was clear from what he did say that uh, that he wouldn't. So they're just going to find a way with, you know, Rodri and Gundogan um, to, to share those minutes, whether Rodri and Gundogan can play, can both play, play at Everton and then Real Madrid at home having done Real Madrid away I don't know um, but that is kind of what is the ideal scenario for for City and you know if if they play well enough against Everton to allow some players to come off um, then I think absolutely Phillips could get 30 or 40 minutes but I just think he's not trusted to play when games are in the balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're certainly intrigued to see what happens at Goodison Park. But finally, Joe, I know it's been, as, as well as a good week for um, City, the first team, it's been a good week for the academies as well. So why don't you touch on that to bring us home? Yeah, the uh, the treble double, I've, I've sort of termed it, but it's uh, the under-21s won the Premier League 2 for the third year in a row. And then on Wednesday at the Etihad, the under-18s won the national final in the uh, under-18s Premier League. They've won the North Division for four years in a row. And because there wasn't a national final in 2020, they are three years in a row winners of the uh, national title. No team had done the double beforehand. No team has then clearly done uh, the, the treble double. And it's the first time that a team has won three in a row in the uh, in the under 18s for for national final. And it's it just shows that the long term planning that's that's gone on at City in in the youth team because you know there's players move through the age groups every year, and the style of football is the same, and the 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 conveyor belt, if you like, still. Uh, finds very very good young players and it, on Wednesday it was West Ham and West Ham got exactly the same points as City in the Southern Division uh, they won the Youth Cup by absolutely demolishing Arsenal at the uh, Emirates Stadium with Arsenal having beaten City in the semi-final albeit having a man more for about 115 minutes but to win uh, I think it was 5-1 at the Emirates is is very good going and, and Ben Wilkers and the head coach said afterwards that this is these are the two best U teams in the country and West Ham are the best team he's come up against in his couple of years as, as head coach but I mean West Ham missed a lot of chances they were the better team for probably about an hour um, they went ahead but City just hung in there and Justin Abovado, uh, again, excuse my uh, my pronunciation, um, he scored twice. One, a bit of a lucky header squirmed under the goalkeeper, but you know, as soon as it went to extra time, City had the momentum, had the legs and we're always going to win and uh, Justin smashes in a, another goal and, and City go on to win and it was, it was maybe not the most polished performance, but it you, you chat to, to Ben Wilkinson and he says these are the games where you find out about the players and you know you can you can win games along the season and, and win comfortably I think they won 12 in a row at one point in the league to, to win the title but these games where there are really small fine margins there where you find out about the young players and it, when they come to decide who's going to step up next year these are the games it seems that take you know, have a lot of sway in that. So, uh, no, it, it it was a very, very encouraging night to cap off the year for for the academy. The only thing I'd say is it was really disappointing how few people there were there. There was only a, a few hundred, mostly family and friends. I would put that down more to City not promoting the game. You know, you go to the Etihad for the first team games, there's no promotion of it, nothing on social media apart from watch it online rather than go to the game. You know, these, these youngsters are making history and... 
you, you, you feel like you can get far more fans there and create a bit of an atmosphere. I think for the Youth Cup final, there was 30,000 there. So um, I think that's maybe a missed opportunity somewhere where there can be a bit more of a push next season. But you, you don't bet against those youngsters doing it again next season and making it four in a row on an academy double. And, you know, if the Premier, if the senior team can win the, the Premier League, then... I think that's that'll be three in a row where they've got the senior Premier League, the Premier League two, and the under 18s Premier League, which is just shows the the dominance and the hold City have over English football at all levels. Absolutely, the future is certainly bright for City, and we can only hope that that casts to the coming weekend, where they of course play Everton, and we'll be back next Monday with any luck to discuss that game and look forward in a bit more detail to the semi final second leg against Real Madrid, and then we'll be back further on in the week to talk about that game and all the fallout. I'm sure that will be an exciting one. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the Talking City podcast. Thank you all very much for listening. And if you're enjoying this, you might well like our extra pods as well. That will be dropping into your feed if you just click that little subscribe button. That will be covering managers' press conferences, which will be coming up later today on Monday. Um, What day are we on? What day is it? Friday? <laughs> Completely lost. Um, <laughs> later on today on Friday and of course much more content besides where you can also get on our YouTube channel which is Man City, uh, Manchester City dash MEN. We're nearly at that magic 1k subs mark so if you could give us another little subscription right on there that would be very, very welcome indeed and of course you can get us all on Twitter at Man City MEN, on Facebook Manchester Evening News dash MEN and of course the place to go for all the expert analysis and breaking news is Manchester Evening News dot co dot uk forward slash manchester city i've got so much intro outro to do now i'm absolutely scrambling but we'll call it quits there before it gets any worse thank you all very much for listening and we'll see you next week Ta-ra. Ta-ra.